Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the all-in-one cloud-based e-learning authoring tool for teams. You can learn more at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. I'm winded, so much activity. <laughs> that aerobic workout that we get every morning, every Wednesday here. Every Wednesday morning on Idiotic, brought to you by Domino. Domino, Domino, Domino. With special effects added by Brent and Chris. Live. There you go. That was, that was a good one, yeah. I'm still working on my Zooms, but uh, yeah, I can't. Get it just quite like I used to. Yeah, there it hands is. Hands are too shaky. Hey, look at the weather reports coming in from everybody. Dang, all over the globe. Look at that. There's weather everywhere you go. That's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Funny how that works. Weird. How many of you yeah. have weather? <laughs> weather or not. Weather or not. Uh, yeah, so yeah, always cool to hear what to, what people are experiencing in their in their own spaces. Um, friends, we have Clark Quinn joining us here today. Um, it's the first time Clark's been with us. Um, Clark, there may actually be, believe it or not, some folks in the chat, uh, et cetera, who, who don't know much about you. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself to our gang. Ah, well, thanks, Chris. Um, I'm Clark Quinn of Quinnovation. I'm a cognitive science, learning science, technology design geek. I saw the connection between computers and learning as an undergraduate, designed my own major, and it's been my career ever since. I hate to tell you how long it's been now. Um, first job was designing and programming educational computer games. Um, realized we didn't know enough, went back to get a PhD in applied cognitive science, and have been that's been the remaining focus. You know, Did the academic route for a while, joined some startups, been a consultant for the past couple of decades to organizations and learning strategy, but that focus on how do we use, uh, how do we design solutions in ways that match the way our brains work and particularly performance and learning solutions? So, mm -hmm. and that matches up with today's topic, of course, because I think most people who do know you, I'm sure there's only a handful in the chat who uh, don't, but um, they probably know you from your fantastic book, uh the learning sciences and and learning science but today we're talking about the sort of the flip side of that tell us a little bit about more about what what that new book is going to be about well i believe that learning experience design is the elegant integration of learning science with engagement and there if you look at the sort of history of the publication of books on learning science it's accelerated you know, way back in 2004, we had Ruth Clark, and then around 2009 or something, we had Julie Dirksen's great design for how people learn, but it's accelerated. And just recently, there's Miriam Nealon and, and Paul Kirshner's book, Evidence Informed Learning Design, and uh, Ruth Clark's got another book, and um, it it's, and um, my own book, <laughs> which ATD asked, and I, after I finished that, I said, what do we need? And I'd actually been thinking beforehand that I wanted to write about learning experience design as a whole book. But I, as I realized, I was writing essentially the phone book. It was going to be huge. <laughs> um, so after ATD asked me to write the learning science book, I said, what next? I said, why don't I write the book that complements it, that focuses on the engagement side? And I really think there hasn't been as much said that's you know succinct and practical and yet evidence-informed about that. So that's what this book is about. It's and. I was going to, you know, put the title about engagement because that's what it's about. But unfortunately, I feels like a lot of what engagement could be has been undermined. It's been, tar you know, 
return to meaning just, you know, click to see more or bells and whistles or scores and points and badges. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how do we really take it beyond that? It was my our colleague, Charles Jennings, who pointed that out to me and said, you probably don't want to use term engagement. So that's why it's titled Make It Meaningful. But that's also the core idea behind it is how do we tap into true intrinsic meaningfulness that we can leverage to help people recognize that you know, to both get them hooked in at the beginning, I use a fishing metaphor and I'm not mm -hmm. a fisher person, so I probably bugger it up. But um, <laughs> the notion is to hook them initially and then to land them, to carry them through to the fruition of the learning experience. And so that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. it, it, when you're talking about the, I don't know, let's call the shiny object syndrome of, uh, you know, or or even the, the silly object syndrome of more buttons or more, you know, more things that we think are, I'm going to use the word in, engaging. Um, I've always thought of, of, of the challenge that we face is kind of bridging or combining intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. I mean, we can tell people you have to take this thing or you have to, you know, go through this learning experience um, and they will do it because their job, you know, <laughs> they're not going to get paid or, you know, or whatever, but, but how do you actually start triggering people to take things and actually then begin applying them? You've really got to start tapping into their actual own intrinsic motivation to recognize that they can, that they should be doing something, you know, different or, or, or better, et cetera. Um, and yeah, more buttons or, or more animations don't really bring us any closer to that, uh, to that goal. In fact, they can interfere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's there's sort of two things mixed in there. And one is, you know, um, helping them recognize that this is relevant to them. So it's both that we know that learning sticks better when people are emotionally engaged, mm -hmm. um, when their emotions are triggered. And, uh, you know, surprise is a, and unexpectedness helps. But also if we care about it, it's, we're going to pay attention. And you're absolutely right. Too much of what we do, we just start assuming that people need to know this and start telling them what they need to know without helping them understand at the up front, why should you care? And I, there's so little treatment of that. And it's so mm. important that it's really worth calling out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in, in, in terms of, you know, thinking about this, is there um, like, are there a handful of things that we should probably bake into our planning and design processes to, to be able to, you know, make this work better? Uh, where, where would people start with this if they want to do it better? Well, it, it starts actually before you design the learning. It starts with making sure you have objectives that actually do matter. Too often you get somebody who comes to the in learning design department and says, I need a course on X. Mm -hmm. And that's not really the problem. You know, so per performance consulting should precede this and make sure that it is indeed a knowledge skill gap that you're addressing. It's not a problem with incentives or the wrong people or a lack of resources or a lot of other reasons that people aren't performing. But if you then identify a real gap and you know what that is and why it's important to the organization, you use that as leverage to start communicating that to the people. But, you know, there's a lot that really goes into behind this. People should know what their role in the organization is and how they contribute so that then when you're being doing something that meaningful to the organization, you care about it because you're connected to that as well. But it's the simple hook I like is, is the consequences of knowing it or not knowing it. Because the hook, the, the initial thing that you want to get them, I believe you have to open them up emotionally for learning even before you open them cognitively. And we know cognitively that reactivating relevant knowledge and um, letting people know what the experience is going to be helps. But emotionally, I think you need to get them to go, you know, I do need this. And my trick for that is consequences. Either, you know, and you can do it positively or negatively, and you can do it humorously or dramatically. So you sort of have one of these quadrant type of things, oversimplification, but I, I think it helps to, to focus on design. Certain audiences, you want to show the positive consequences of having it. You're going to be able to save lives. Or, you know, and other audiences, I per have a predilection, I admit, for the sort of the, the black humor that says, what are the consequent humorous consequences of not knowing this? And, um, so, uh, we, I literally opened some e-learning uh, modules, each with a cartoon that, that showed 
uh, the negative consequences of not having the knowledge. Like, you know, somebody's using a shovel to try and dig the Panama Canal and somebody's over there pointing to a steam shovel going, use the right tool for the job. Um, so it's, but, you know, you can do any one of those four, but you want to know what the consequences are and you want to make those manifest and have people going, you know, yeah, those consequences matter to me. I get it. There is an ideal. You look at um, DC and Ryan self-determination theory, and they have a very complex model of motivation, starting you know from apathy all the way up to full intrinsic motivation. And intrinsic motivation is fabulous if you can generate it, but it's not guaranteed because you can't really know what people are going to care about. But the one level down is, you know, I need this, but I don't you know, you're not guilting me into it. I really recognize I need it. And that I think we can do reliably. And that's what I think we ought to do. So that's the starting point is to say, make sure it really matters and then help them viscerally understand why it matters. Mm -hmm. give, me those, give me those two again. Give, give me what makes the, the graph again. I'm going I'm to draw <laughs> this so I remember. Okay. I would encourage everybody Positive. at home to do the same. <laughs> positive consequences of having the knowledge or negative consequences of not having the knowledge. Okay. And then you can do it humorously or dramatically. So a dramatic version, Michael Allen's flight safety video was a famous example. And yes. they, they had these flight uh, attendants who were not doing their pre-flight safety check, just like pilots have the safety checklist. Flight attendants had it too, but they weren't doing it because, you know, they get on the plane. Oh, I haven't seen you since Paris and two, you know, seven months ago, how are you been? And you also have to carry on this big book for all the different planes and, the, you know, the novices do, and they didn't want to look like novices, so they weren't doing it. So what the Allen Interactions did was they opened the experience with this video that was like a disaster movie. It was done in animation style, not live video, but there was this plane and it takes off and it's flying and then it goes into a storm and suddenly there's danger and man, they're forced to land on the water and they go to inflate the life rafts and the life raft thing, the inflators is not, it's empty. There's nothing to inflate there because they hadn't done the checklist. And after that, do you think they were ready to hear the message about flight safety checklists? I want to suggest they were a lot more than if you said, today we're going to talk about flight safety checklists and their importance in your role. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. No, I, it's funny that you even mentioned that because that's one of the... Uh, I hearken back to that one a lot too. I suppose it is kind of, it probably dates us both a little bit, but, <laughs> um, but it's a good one. I mean, that, that was one of the, I mean, I was, I was early in my career and I remember that, that being a particular aha moment when he came and uh, he came and spoke uh, to Intel when I was working there, they, they brought him in. And that was the first time I heard somebody start talking like that about this is how we need to do things differently and he he really uh that that one day-long workshop with him really turned things around for me and he showed that and i was like oh, okay now i get it so uh good stuff if yeah if you guys haven't read michael allen's books uh he, well his book i guess he's done one i don't know if he's done another one but he's, he's updated it a couple times I yeah that's what it's a called, second or third a edition one. Michael yeah, Allen's guide to e-learning and there it was go. yeah Michael Allen and he had to you know he used to have it up and he took it down actually because people were misinterpreting it sorry mm. I misspelled it in the uh misspelled <laughs> misinterpreting in the uh chat but I figured it was better to just send it than to try and go <laughs> fix it um, but yeah so you can't find it anymore uh but it's as uh Brent points out it's famous and um and the message there is is valuable for people sure and, yeah his book is somewhere <laughs> yeah and his book on you know my, his guide to learning is a really good comprehensive book and he's updated it now with you know because he's been doing his sam stuff and his ccaf stuff challenge curiosity uh activity and feedback is his shorthand for making meaningful practice so very cool because it um, drives the point home with the what the humorous and dramatic spectrum versus the um, positive and negative feedback spectrum. I really like that. It's a, it's a great one. Chris, you were going to say something. Sorry. 
I actually just was noting, noticing uh, that Netta has a comment in the chat. We had to train 120 plants on a radical software upgrade and users were not excited about the required <laughs> training. Uh, to open the first class, we invited them to execute a few tasks in the upgraded system without any direction. After about 20 minutes of them fumbling around, they were ready to learn. Well, that's, yeah, throw them into a sense of, uh, of safe jeopardy in, in that kind of a, of a model and, and then they build their own intrinsic recognition why yeah okay i gotta i gotta i gotta do this so yeah isn't that yeah. often the case though with software especially too i mean i know i'm i'm guilty of that as well it's like oh i can just learn it on my own i'll jump in and just play around with it <laughs> and then sooner or later i'm like yeah, all right i'll open up the manual all right i'll go through the training they created for me okay i'll call somebody and say yeah i'd like to go through the training yeah Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we see that a lot too. Sorry, Clark, you were going to say something. Oh, I just, although that sounds a little learner abusive, it, that's 20 <laughs> minutes of introduction and, and a lot of frustration, and that will generate motivation. I just would hope we might do it a little less uh, punitively. But, you know, it in, in Netta's case, it may well have been the only solution because they would take the attitude exactly you had, Brent, that said, oh, you know, I can figure this out on my own. I don't need you to do it. Although I suspect the resistance was having to do things in a different way. And I, you know, I, a guy named Peter DeJager spoke at, at a guild event on uh, performance support and he talked about change. And he said, you know, there's this myth that people resist change. And it's not true because people cha make changes all the time. They change jobs, they uh, buy a house, they get married, they have kids. Those are all um, changes in their life, but they choose it. And the thing with making, saying we're going to do an upgrade without helping them, give them the opportunity, we can make the software change or not. But here's the benefits we're seeing if we mm -hmm. do make this change. And then, you you know, if you set this up right, they will commit to the change. And then they're still going to backslide unless you do a lot of ongoing support and things. So, but that's, again, part of understanding, you know, motivations and drivers and, and how people really work and the fact that, they resist change that they haven't chosen. So and, even and, some of that, and that kind of change can also feel, um, you know, it's coming down from above. Um, there's a sense of threat sometimes to the self, right? Like I already, you know, this, uh, this is going to affect me in, in being able to perform. This is going to affect me. And even if rationally you can say, oh, right, well, they, we know that it's faster, it's better, or, or, or whatever, and oh, they finally fixed that thing that's been annoying me forever. Um, <laughs> there's still that sense of, I can do this so fast right now, it's going to slow me down or, or, you know, or, or affect my, my performance or my standing or, or, or those sorts of things that we don't, even oft we don't often recognize that kind of sense of, uh, of, of the imposition and the threat to the, you know, the self, that kind of um, the fear aspect of, of something being pushed down like that, so. Absolutely. You know, and all this really is just to hook people up front. I, I want to suggest, I I think, believe there's three things you really need people to, to go before they're really willing to commit to your learning experience. And the first thing is, as I said, you know, I do need this. The second thing is, and I don't know it already. You can have people who go, mm. you know, I would need this, but I know it. And you may have to convince them that they don't before they're really willing. We did a, uh, I was working with a client and they, had customers who thought they knew how to sell trucks and they really didn't. And we actually had to have an activity beforehand that demonstrated that they didn't. And then suddenly they were really eager for learning. But the third, you need a third thing too, is that they have to believe that this experience will actually change that. And we may have undermined that a lot in the e-learning we've created <laughs> that is ineffective knowledge point, you know, knowledge dump bullet point stuff. And we may have to say, trust, you know, here, let's go through the experience, but we have learned better. And then you need to deliver. You really do need to then create an experience that is effective and engaging and transformational. And that they come out going, you know, wow, I'm a different person because I now have a new set of skills. And uh, we need to make sure that that's the case too and maintain that level of, you know, investment because if they are sucked in and then face an experience that's the same old, same old, <laughs> I think you're you, you will have undermined yourself even worse than you were when you went. For sure. Yeah, the, 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 you have to um, get to, you have to deliver something that gets them beyond the re, the eye roll re, eye roll reaction to more training. Uh, you know, 
um, all of the all of those previous experiences of just being having information shoved at you, for instance, or all those bad experiences and blurring with all of our own experiences of other, you know, bad educational <laughs> situations with someone at the front <laughs> of the room telling us things. And, you know, that we've had a lifetime of being <laughs> of, 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 of in many, I mean, we've all had great educational experiences and, and learning experiences, but we've also had all had lots of bad ones. And we kind of yeah. think react with the eye roll effect uh, when too often when we're being told, Oh, this is more training that you need to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and Netta, Netta follows up in the chat. Uh, for those folks who are listening to the podcast version of this after the fact, I, I don't want them to miss out. This is good. Uh, and she follows up with, yes, especially since they were going to have to train users back at their plant, really helped turn around the veteran experienced users who did not realize how much had changed. And I think that's hmm. an, an excellent uh, an, an excellent point to period at the end of that whole conversation right there in uh, those experienced users and those veterans that feel like I'm fast. I'm already really good at this. I'm actually the one that trains others. Why are they changing all this now? Now I'm not going to be the expert anymore and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's nice to know that, that, uh, you know, when they can see that there is important changes happening, and um, and then they buy into it. It's huge. It's huge. And we I think we all too often we do forget about that. Yeah, and I we do. And I think there's a couple things at play there. P part of it, I think we have this legacy of believing that uh, we are formal, logical reasoning beings. If we're presented with new information, we'll naturally just change to accommodate. And it turns out that's not true at all. Um, even if we do commit to it, we will quickly backslide if we aren't supported and reinforced and, and, and trained going forward. But I think that also leads to uh, we don't have to address the emotional side because we're these formal logical reasoning beings. And uh, no, guess what? We learn better when we're emotionally engaged and motivated, as we started out saying, and you know, as you pointed out, Chris. So I think that um, uh, we, we have a legacy. And I like to ask audiences, you know, how many of you have ever seen a quiz question in your career where the alternatives of the right answer were so dumb or silly that you could get it right without having learned anything? And mm. everybody raises their hands. This is just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, yeah. It's so ubiquitous and such a waste of time. It's a waste of the learner's time. It's a waste of the designer's time. Stop it. <laughs> Yeah, all this stuff that we keep talking about for for you know that I'm going to say the e word and I'm trying to avoid it that that you know to get people engaged and uh, you know excited and the and the what's in it for me part of it that's all that upfront work that we need to do. But when we're talking about making meaningful learning solutions, right? We we've hit that upfront part about it. You know, is there anything we can do in the in the middle or that or the end or or what what comes after that first part? The first part's super important, right? We got to get that with them in it, but but then what? Well, I, that's yes. How do we keep that level of engagement going? And there's a couple things we need to do. We need to minimize the content, which isn't to say none. We need to have the right models and examples, but we don't need a lot of fluff. We don't need the nice to know. We just need the must know. But the most critical thing I think, besides getting that emotional hook right, is making the right practice. It's it do, which doesn't mean it's ex, it can't be dressed into a fantastic setting. Like you know, instead of uh, solving business problems in in your business, you might be solving it on a spaceship or you know in the wild west, as has been done. Um, but it has to have a number of elements. It has to have the right level of challenge. It can't be too easy or it's boring and it can't be too challenging or it's just frustrating. See, and we're not necessarily going to get that right. We will make good guesses, but we probably should test it to validate it. And that's one of the things we don't do either is too often do we test our learning and then go back and retune it. And anytime you're dealing with human experience, you should expect some tuning and build that into your timeline and build that into your budget and build that into your process. Um, and, but you want to have people doing the things in the practice that they will need to be doing, applying the knowledge. So doing a knowledge test at the end of a content dump isn't meaningful practice unless they have, absolutely have to recall information by rote. 
But really what they tend to have to do, particularly going forward, I suggest what's going to make a difference for organizations is not people's ability to recite knowledge, it's ability to make decisions. So you need to embed those decisions in the learning environment, make them challenging enough, gradually increase the challenge until they're taking on the full thing. Don't start you know, with a totally frustrating one that they can't do yet. Build it up, but give them a sequence of practice at the right level of challenge and situate those decisions in a meaningful story. So it's not just, oh, so-and-so is this one. Hey, we are trying to accomplish this. We've got this deal we need to close. Don't just do a close a deal. Close the deal that's going to save the company. Don't just, you know, operate on a patient. Operate on the ambassador's daughter. Find a way to ramp up the story and the challenge without distorting the core necessities of what they're doing. Build up around it. So challenging practice with just the minimal content surrounding it to do it, I suggest, is what's going to be the most engaging. And it's truly, if you read, you know, Raph Koster is a game designer and he wrote a book called The Theory of Fun. And what he claimed made games fun was learning. That you start a level and there's new opponents and you have to master the the new mechanics of these opponents and there's a test at the end it's the boss and you have to apply the skills you've learned in this level to the boss and if you succeed you go move on to the next level what that is is about is learning and so we if we you know and that was my first book on how do you design learning games is this alignment between what makes things effective for learning and what makes experiences engaging. Turns out if you understand the alignment, the elements perfectly support one another and the learning can and should be hard fun. Um, and that's the key to, to what I suggest is, is the answer to your question, Brent, is that the right, uh, right sequence of practice that's keeping you just at the level of your ability is what's gonna engage people. And without a lot of fluff around it, but a, but a, you know, continue to focus on why this is important. Yeah, I think it's hard for. Um, I think we struggle with the human aspect nature of instructors and teachers because, as the subject matter expert or whatnot, if you're standing up in front of the room, you do have this sort of inner need to impart your knowledge on everyone and you want to share right you're desperate to share it's what it's what you're you know you want people to succeed you want to see the light bulb go on and and so so you're you know you just keep talking and i think it's i think it's one of the hardest things for instructors and trainers to do is to stop talking and to let the learners do the practice right or do the work and i think um, I also think there's a little bit of guilt associated with it, right? It's like, well, if I'm not talking and teaching, I'm not adding value and I'm not making my money. I'm not earning the money mm -hmm. that they're paying me to be here, right? And mm -hmm. instead of thinking of it as, no, they're paying me to be here to achieve this outcome. And the best way for me to achieve that outcome is to let these people practice mm -hmm. during a particular period of time and to be okay with that. But I, I, I really do believe that that's one of the reasons why we get so stuck on uh, in that spot and have trouble making that shift, even when it comes to turning it into e-learning. We want to just put all the content in it, right? It's that subject matter expert syndrome. Yeah, they got to know this. They got to know this. They got to know this. And so you build this big, gigantic thing. And uh, so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but it's um, it's just, it's hard. It's it's really hard. If anybody has been a teacher before, I'm sure you've you've figured that out for yourselves too. And, and I similarly, you know, I have the same problem when I run workshops I, yeah, and I have yeah. to force myself to, <laughs> you know, to design activities. And you have to keep in mind that what will drive them to you is activities where they go, oh, OK, now I'm ready for the message. But if you're just presenting it up front without having made it meaningful by giving them a challenge, they go, oh, you know, now I see why that import, information is important. Can I please have that information? And, is is important and also you know record them beforehand but you bring up something really interesting brent that I, is uh part of the cognitive story behind this and there is a cognitive story as well as an emotional story that research from the university of southern california's cognitive technology group richard clark et al is that experts don't have access anymore to what they actually do to the decisions they make 70 percent mm -hmm. of what they um do 
they literally can't tell you. And so, but they can tell you everything they know. So when the instructional designer goes to the subject matter expert and says, what should be in this course? They recite all that knowledge and the good little instructional designer puts all that knowledge in and then tests that knowledge to make sure it's there. And that's not gonna lead to any change. And you really have to have more complicated processes to get into what really needs to be done. I like to triangulate, look at people performing, talk to expert performers, talk to the supervisors who can always tell you what people do wrong um, and get that picture of what they really need to do and then bake that into learning and take away all that knowledge unless it helps them do make those decisions better. Um, yeah, yes, they, they never ask that, what should be in this course. The subject matter experts don't remember what it's like to be a beginner. I think is the mm -hmm. sim over simplest the simplification. Is that, is that a word? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm oversimplifying it by saying that, but I think that's part of it, right? They 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 don't remember what it's like when they first started out. They just know what it's like for them now. So they spout off all the advanced, high level stuff that they think everybody should know, but they forget that a lot of times beginners don't have any clue what you're talking about. Because they don't, they don't remember dialing it back. They don't remember all those steps they had to go through to get to that level of experience. So, well, and it's and it's compiled away below their conscious awareness because the whole one of the things of learning is to automate what should be automated, so our conscious thinking can be focused on the complex decisions we need to make. And therefore, because it's been called by the way, they don't even know aware that they have that. And I like Alan Schoenfeld's stuff where he, when he works examples, he deliberately makes mistakes and works backwards to unpack the thinking that goes into monitoring yourself and performing and recognizing that experts actually make lots of errors. The average airline pilot makes several errors an hour, but the systems are robust to accommodate. <laughs> We're not good at doing rote behaviors. That's not our architecture. We have some random. Yeah, exactly. My PhD advisor studied that stuff. And, uh, um, you know, he told me that I was like, oh, and he goes, Mer at the time, American Airlines was the best. That was decades ago. So I'm not sure it's true anymore. <laughs> um, all those but, pilots are dead by now. Is that <laughs> well, they practice intensely for stuff they hope they never have to do. Yeah. <laughs> but they want to make sure that if it does happen, it's really important that they get it right. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So how do we? So okay. So we 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 started off with the with the beginning. The the what's in it for me? How do we figure all that stuff out? And in the middle, what do we deal with there? How do we wrap this up? Well, what comes at the tail end of this? What are the types of things that we need to talk about when we're making meaningful learning solutions? Right. Well, the first thing is we don't tend to do any wrapping up really. Okay, you're done. Instead of, rec you know, I think you should acknowledge that they've expended effort and energy and say, you know, hey, you spent a lot of time. Congratulations. And now help them recognize what they've accomplished. You have demonstrated. Now, you should have made sure that the final practice has is such that it, they have demonstrated that they can now do this, at least to a level where they're confident enough to go try it when they face it out in the real world the next time. So and you should say, hey. Congratulations. You should, I, you know, for any relatively serious commitment to learning, you should signify it. You know, I, I while I don't like uh, points and leaderboards, I don't mind badges that, uh, you know, signify you now have um, uh, accomplished this. You've acquired this level. I even introduce them to the community of practitioners now. It says you're now one of the members of this community. I think we don't do enough mm -hmm. about helping segue from that community of learners into the community of practitioners. Um, I th you know, there's the obvious things to do. Here's what you're now prepared to go do. You know, here's further directions. You've now achieved this level that opens up these gates. Also, if you, you know, we went to a reasonable depth, but if you're really interested in this stuff, here's where to go find out more about each of the things we covered. So there's give them, you know, signify what they've accomplished and facilitate them going further. I loved to, many years ago, we developed a course on speaking to the media and the experts there had this statement for how to make a statement that was easy to process for reporters. So they would probably recite it back to the, to the audience, their audience, um, relatively verbatim. And they had, you know, they called it the sex statement, 
which worked but let alone by itself because that's such a highly salient word, but it meant statement, examples, explanation. But they gave you ways to continue to practice it. They said, use it with your colleagues. Just practice using it when you're communicating to your colleagues. Use it with your kids. It will penetrate their haze, you know, their adolescent haze and, and actually communicate. So, and that was really important is rec and you know, also advise to people go out now and evaluate. So let me say to your audience right here, now go look at other learning that you've created or others have created and say, have they addressed the emotional elements? Have they done this? And, you know, c congrats for having listened to us for this long. Thank you for <laughs> persisting. Um, <laughs> go forth and do more engagement stuff. So, but it, it, it is closing the emotional experience as well as the cognitive one. And both of those need should be done and, you know, we barely do the cognitive one, let yeah. alone the emotional one. I, I think we would be remiss if we did not uh, recap the sex part of this conversation. <laughs> what, what exactly did that stand for again? <laughs> Statements, <laughs> examples, explanation. Okay. Look at, see, this is trivial engagement, <laughs> not deep engagement. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, Sensationalism. I, 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 yeah, well, you know, it makes a good point, though. I mean, I think you're right. And um, a very tangential point uh, to all of this conversation is uh, you mentioned it was from journalism, but uh, I think we get a lot of what we do from other practices, right, outside of what we do. And, uh, you know, that's that's one of them, right? How to be a good interviewer, right? Talking to a subject matter expert, you're basically being a journalistic interviewer. You're being an investigative reporter, right? And and you, you know, so using, you know, little monikers like that, you know, and just to remember what are the best ways to ask. I think somebody mm -hmm. mentioned in the chat, too, asking why. Uh, Tim dropped that in, right? Mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. Love the word why when talking with SMEs, right? Oh, just constantly ask them, well, why? And then you say it and you say, well, why do they do that? Well, why do they do that? <laughs> Act Focus like a five-year-old, right? Why? <laughs> right. And how will we know? What is the observable difference in performance? You know, that's really important as well. You know, that's part of getting good objectives is how will we know when they, they're now performing appropriately? What is the observable stuff? And it's a bit behavioristic, but we can't ignore the empirical rigor and results we've got from behaviorism, even if we move to cognitivism and now post-cognitivism, um, we still should pay attention. And I think that's absolutely right. And we should be paying attention to relevant fields, related fields. You know, uh, Stephen Johnson talking about where innovation comes from, it's paying attention to the adjacent possible. And we should be paying attention to journalism where we need to communicate messages just like they need to communicate stories. We need to talk to marketing to look at how to be more effective at communicating. We need to look at software engineering for process guidance. We need to look at graphic design for how to do visuals. There's lots of influences we should be integrating successfully. And you're absolutely right that, you know, uh, finding good communicative shorthands is a, is a valuable point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jan. Jan reiterates our, our earlier part of the conversation with what is the worst that can happen if they don't? Uh, it's a great <laughs> question, right? But that that falls along that uh, that chart we were talking about earlier. Yeah. It takes us full circle with the, the positive and the negative, right? Mm -hmm. What you know, if they don't learn this, what's you know, what's what's the worst possible outcome? You know, and mm -hmm. and. and and using that as instructional designers to give them that motivation and then to also practice the thing that leads them to not <laughs> run into that really mm -hmm. negative experience, mm -hmm. right? Is that middle part. And then, you know, congratulating them in at the end and everything. I think the other thing at the end of it that we haven't talked about too much yet, though, is also that need to, um, uh, that spaced repetition part of it, right? And mm. uh, there's the science behind that, right? How, how can we continue to deliver little messages to keep that information fresh in their mind? Okay, they've learned it, they've practiced the heck out of it, and we think, okay, we're done, but maybe we're not quite so done. Maybe they, you know, what what comes at the very, very end, or con or that mm. continues? Or, yeah, how do you keep it continuing? So you close sort of the experience but that doesn't mean that they're done learning. And it there's a, a graph of Will Tal, our colleague Will Talheimer did about spaced learning. And the question is how much ongoing 
reactivation do you need and how much practice do you need initially and how much spacing? And the answer, of course, is it depends. <laughs> if this is something they're going to be performing a lot shortly after the learning experience, you don't need to do a lot of reactivation. But it's something that only happens infrequently. You're probably going to need a lot of reactivation, particularly depending on how important it is. You know, if, you know, you're going to cost you buckets of money or, you know, in a variety of ways or lives or whatever, you probably want to do a lot of reactivation to make sure they've got a really high retention of that. Yeah, but, you know, it doesn't matter, you know. If it if it happens infrequently and isn't important, maybe it's not worth a course. Maybe you should use a job aid instead, right? That's part of your performance consulting decision up front. But yes, reactivating at appropriate times and extending it. We've got you up to the level where you know we're not going to lose customers or cost buckets of money as you start out. But you're not really ready for the most complex tasks. Let's give you a support structure. Let's give you people you can call on if you face a challenge that you're not quite ready for. Let's give you coaching on your performance and continue to improve it. Let's reactivate those models. Let's also, technologically, we can deliver several different types of reactivation. We can give you reconceptualization, a new model, a way to think about it. We can give you a recontextualization, a new example, yet another example that helps spread the space of transfer. Or we can give you a reapplication, another challenge, another problem to solve, just a quiz question, but make it a mini scenario, not a knowledge test, you know. Um, even, you know, the least you can do is go from knowledge retention questions to make them little mini scenarios and just ask them to, to, to make a decision based on that knowledge. And, you know, that's just a better written multiple choice question. Uh, shout out to Patty Shank's book on how to write better multiple choice. Questions. I was just gonna say I was just looking around for that because I had that book literally right. Oh, actually, I still have it. It was just being hidden under the thing. If anybody wants that one, yeah, we got mm -hmm. it. It's uh, it. It very very quickly became one of my favorite books and most read and most referred to recently. So, um, yeah, un understanding how to do that is super important because sometimes that's really all you all you all you have available to you is to be able to write multiple choice questions, mm -hmm. you know, as much as we either like it or don't like it as instructional designers, it doesn't really matter. In a lot of cases, it's all you've got for an assessment tool. So you might as well figure out how to write really good ones. And that's one mm -hmm. of the things that Patty talks about a lot is that mm -hmm. writing those scenarios and, and um, you know, giving, painting that picture for them and having them answer questions based on those scenarios mm -hmm. and multiple choice questions. So yeah. well, uh, good stuff. And branch, you know, I, I believe that, you know, simulation games, um, the simulation is just a model, but if you put it into initial state and ask the learner to take it to a goal state, that's a scenario and you can tune that into a game and you should. That's built on an underlying model of the situation, which isn't always feasible, but branching scenario, you know, M mentored life performance is the best, but that doesn't scale well because mentoring, individual mentoring is challenging and yeah. life performance, if you screw up, may be costly. <laughs> so the next <laughs> best thing is a, is a good simulation, but th those can be expensive to develop. And the next best thing to that are branching scenarios. And almost everybody's, you know, authoring tool um, now can do that. And those are powerful learning experiences because, you know, granted, uh, to your point, Brent, you know, multiple choice questions may be the easiest tool we have, and we can make those good. But branching scenarios, because these decisions tend to travel in packs. Oh, well, I, you know, I pissed off the customer. I'm not dumb, though. I may be able to go back and make it up. Let's build that into the scenario and give them the chance to practice recovery as well. Um, you know, <laughs> if they don't get it right. Indeed. So. And that kind of a structure also situates the information within, uh, you know, an experience that becomes memory, becomes story, etc. Helping, uh, you know, mm -hmm. recall and, and, and context. Nancy has a really nice phrasing of it uh, in in the chat there. Class or e-learning is the start line; it's not the finish line. Ah, what yeah. a fantastic way to wrap all of this up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hey, gang, uh, you can hear the music, so it's time to dance on out of here for, for Wednesday. Clark, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, as always, every conversation with you um, is a fabulous one, um, and I'm so glad that we finally got you to, to join us here on, on Idiotic. Um, folks in the chat, 
Idiotic is, of course, sponsored by Domino One. So if you're interested at all in learning, and yeah, we actually have branching scenario uh, features within the Domino One authoring platform. As a nice segue to wrap us up here, I just threw a free a link to the free trial in the in our chat there. Um, Brent has already provided in the, is further up in the chat the LinkedIn group, but maybe he'll drop that link in again. I'll do it again. Yep, awesome stuff. Gang, thanks so much for, for joining us all here today. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Um, shout out if thanks, anybody's guys. joining us from, from the Learning Solutions Conference, which is happening this That's week. That's right. Real yeah. live conferences happening again. Crazy, crazy. What's going on in this world? <laughs> thanks, Clark. It's great to see you, man. Good to catch up. Likewise, yeah. Brent. Nice to meet you, Chris. And thanks, everybody, for showing up. I hope it was worth your while. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, gang. We'll catch you all next time. Toodles, gang. Here we are. Let's get A. Oops. Adios, everybody.